Hi, and welcome to the third developmental session in our series, Conversation Analysis and Healthcare Interactions. Today, we'll be looking at turn design. Before we get started, here are the articles we'll be using for today's session. In this session, we're going to look at the key features of turn design. We'll identify some of these features in treatment recommendations in primary care encounters. We'll also take time to consider the influence of the clinical setting and how this relates to responses to recommendations. From there, we'll have a discussion round to address two key questions of our session. And during these rounds, you'll get the chance to contribute with observations, thoughts, ideas or questions. And as a reminder, contributions are both encouraged and welcome, but they're entirely voluntary. Skipping your turn will always be a valid choice. And don't forget, having your PDFs open at this point will be helpful. So, just to recap, here's what we covered in the last session. We took a look at some of the basic practices involved in doing conversation analysis. We identified some basic conversation analytic methods and concepts and we examined some examples of collections within healthcare settings. For today, we're going to take a look at the concept of turn design. When we take a turn at talk, it's designed to do something during the interaction. That is to say, the turn can be designed to accomplish a particular social action. These actions include offers, invitations, informing, assessments, and so on. Each turn is typically designed to be related in some way to what has come before it. And likewise, each turn at talk can set up conditions and contingencies for what comes next. As John Heritage describes it, turns at talk are both context shaped and context renewing. And it's this understanding that is the basis of the adjacent say pair, or as Sachs initially described it, the concept of nextness with turns at talk where one turn at talk is typically followed by one particular other turn at talk. Adjacency pairs include pairs of greetings, pairs of farewells, questions and responses. And it's important to understand that turn design is more than a matter of the words that we choose. Like all aspects of social interaction, turn design can be seen to have order at all points. Turn design in addition to word choice, relates to timing, intonation, emphasis, embodied actions, and so on. And in this respect, alternative turn designs can accomplish alternative social actions, which can in turn place affordances or constraints upon what comes next. However, these turns could only be successful if they are received as intended. This accomplishment of shared understanding between participants is otherwise known as intersubjectivity, and the ways that we design turns can impact greatly upon how they are received. This example shows how changes only in emphasis can accomplish different social actions within the same turn at talk. In the first example, the emphasis is on I. I didn't steal your red hat. The available inference there is that someone else did. In the second, the emphasis is upon steal. I didn't steal your red hat. You can then infer that they may have borrowed it or received permission. In the third, the emphasis is on your. I didn't steal your red hat. The available inference there is that they may have stolen someone else's. In the fourth, the emphasis is on red. I didn't steal your red hat you might be able to infer that they may have stolen a different hat. And in the fifth, the emphasis is on hat. I didn't steal your red hat. A possible inference there is that they stole something else that was red. When it comes to turn design, turns can be designed according to their sequential position within an interaction. This means that they are shaped by what came before them. However, Turns at talk can vary in the extent to which they rely upon the previous turn to be meaningful. The excerpt that I've included below is a turn 
that is made meaningful when you realize that it is someone talking on the phone about their losses suffered from a house fire. The turn, I guess the hardest thing is things that mean things, you know? It's a really great example of something that relies heavily upon the prior turns to be understood as meaningful. And even then, just understanding the topical context of this turn can make it more meaningful. And this would not be so easy without some kind of scene setting contextual information. So, as I've mentioned already, turns are designed to accomplish particular social actions. And these designs can convey different forms of the same action. A good example of this is the way that people make invitations. And invitations are interesting as they place normative expectations upon the recipient to accept an invitation. And it also opens up the possibility of rejection for the person making the invitation. As such, invitations can be designed in a way to convey varying degrees of formality that can mitigate this burden upon the recipient. For example, do you want to get lunch? This is a, a relatively informal invitation and minimizes the imposition upon the recipient should they have to decline. More formally, something like, next Saturday's a surprise party for Kevin, and if you could make it, that would be great. This is more formal, but still provides the recipient with some kind of contingency to refuse the invitation. So let's take a look at how turn design has been applied to healthcare interactions. In this case, within the context of primary care consultations. Within the context of healthcare interactions where treatment recommendations are made, turn design can convey varying degrees of medical authority. And this shouldn't come as a particular surprise when you consider the normative configuration of the doctor-patient relationship. In this respect, treatment recommendations can be designed in ways that incorporate both epistemic and deontic authority. In this respect, the doctor has expert level knowledge to make the recommendation and at the same time, they have an obligation to help the patient. In making treatment recommendations, doctors can design their turns to incorporate degrees of epistemic and deontic authority. And in these designs, they can place affordances and constraints upon what comes next. This has implications for patient engagement in treatment decisions. Like offers and invitations in everyday settings, these designs can relate to entitlement, contingency, and the situated relationship between the participants. And the situation is something that's worth considering. These are primary care consultations where there's a strong normative expectation to respond to a recommendation. And in that response, the recommendation will be normatively weighted in the direction of acceptance. This is, after all, usually the reason why a patient attends a primary care consultation, that is, to seek help for an experienced problem. While patients can resist, the situation may in itself present barriers to this act. That is not to say that it doesn't happen, it's just something to keep in mind as we look at the data. In developing a taxonomy of treatment recommendations, the research in our focus paper identified five recommendation types, pronouncements, suggestions, proposals, offers, and assertions. Although this final one was relatively rare, it's certainly worthy of inclusion. Pronouncements might be considered as the most overtly authoritative form of treatment recommendation. They are unilateral in design, conveying that the decision has already been made. The design of the pronouncement conveys the highest degree of entitlement and it affords very little by way of contingencies. In these designs, the doctor asserts full epistemic and deontic authority in relation to the recommendation. Crucially, this form of delivery can be seen to minimize opportunity spaces for patient engagement which is an important aspect of treatment decision-making. It's therefore interesting to note 
that these forms of delivery are rarely resisted. And while this may be related to the turn design, I think it's important to remember the wider situational setting in this respect. This is an example of a pronouncement. This excerpt has three important turns and I want to draw your attention to these in particular. Line one, I think we'll have to investigate. Line four, I'll start you on treatment. And line seven, so it means you'll have to actually have. These all pronounce things that are going to happen regardless. The decision is settled. During this sequence, the patient's turns are merely to enable the doctor to continue. That is to say, they are continuers. Also, as a point of interest, it's worth noting the turn design on line four. There's a self-repair from tablets to supplements. Speculatively, this adjustment in turn design might have been to project a greater degree of legitimacy in the pronouncement by using the more medically derived term supplements instead of the lay term tablets. Turning to suggestions, these designs differ remarkably. The design seems to shift the responsibility of the decision to the patient, conveying the notion that the choice is theirs. While the doctor retains a high degree of entitlement, that is to say, they convey that they are in possession of the requisite knowledge to make this recommendation, the design affords contingencies for the patient. This shifting of responsibility attenuates some of the doctor's deontic authority as the design projects the impression that the patient can decide what they should or should not do. In this respect, it's up to the patient whether or not they act upon a recommendation that has been formulated as a suggestion. And once again, it's worth keeping in mind that these suggestions are rarely resisted. And this is why it's important to consider more than just the design of these recommendations. So here is an example of a suggestion. There are a few interesting designs in the sequence that I want to draw your attention to. In line one, the doctor asks the patient if they are taking any painkillers. This question is optimized for no. This is a form of preference. That is to say that the normative organization of this question is weighted in the direction of a negative response. The word any is key in formulating this action. And this is something we'll be looking at later in our series. For now, you can get an idea of this in lines two to six. The patient responds that they are taking painkillers. The response comes complete with a delay to the start of the turn and a mitigating account. This is known as a dispreferred response. This means that the response has gone against the normative expectations of the initiating question. Now, when it comes to the suggestion, this is fitted within the wider sequence. The doctor says, I would take them. The word them connects to painkillers in the initiating question. Line 16, the patient responds with an affirmation, which is right, and a continuer, okay. This is indicated in the upward final unit intonation. On line 17, the doctor further elaborates in an apparent bid to persuade the patient. And on line 21, the patient acknowledges affirmatively. And I want to note that in the transcription, it indicates that all three words in this turn were delivered in a fairly flat intonation. So suggestions can be seen to attenuate some of the doctor's deontic authority, and they can also open up opportunity spaces for patient engagement. Nonetheless, the patient's contributions in this excerpt do not differ greatly to those found in the pronouncement excerpt. This is why I think it's important to consider the situation and the situated relationship of the doctor and the patient. Next, we have proposals, which are interesting as proposals are typically understood to be collaborative. In terms of conveying authority, proposals can seem to be a form of middle ground action, sitting between the pronouncement and suggestions. 
Proposals convey that the recommendation and treatment decision are collaborative activities. This means that the proposal can be designed to attenuate the doctor's entitlement while promoting contingencies. This ought to be helpful in promoting patient engagement. Proposals also convey a degree of speculation in the recommendation. Let's try X, or we could always try X. This is an example of a proposal which can be seen to take place on line three. On line three, the doctor proposes with why don't we? This has a socially organized preference for acceptance. To elaborate upon this, consider a lunch invitation. Why don't you join me for lunch? This also has a socially organized preference for acceptance. It would take a fair amount of interactional work to refuse this type of invitation without breaching its norm. The patient's response on line five, okay, is fitted to this type of proposal. It's a typed response that is initiated without delay and without any elaboration. However, it's not necessarily acceptance. The upward final unit intonation indicates a continuer. On line eight, the patient's response, K, can be seen more as an acceptance. In this, we can see how the design of a suggestion can invite collaboration but also how it can motivate acceptance. And once again, we need to consider the patient's contributions in this exchange. Have they truly differed remarkably from the previous excerpts? Turning to offers, this is an interesting category in this paper because all forms of treatment recommendations can be considered as a form of offer. And in this respect, there are multiple ways to design an offer. For example, a declarative offer is designed very much like a pronouncement. In this, you might offer to look after a child by saying, I'll look after her today. Likewise, a doctor can pronounce, I'll start you on iron supplements. Conditional offers are those in which an if-then turn design is used. For example, if you like, I can give you something to help with the pain. Then there are offers described as, do you want? or would you like type offers. This is an example of a conditional offer. The offer takes place on lines five to six. The offer is embedded between two conditionals, if you'd like, and if you're also really stuffy. On line nine, the doctor elaborates on this offer with, you want that too? This design connects with the prior turns. And on line 11, the patient accepts it with a straight, typed interjection of yes. There is no delay and no elaboration. So once again, we can see how turn design might relate to the extent to which patients can engage with or even resist a recommendation. But once again, what's shown in this excerpt is a straight acceptance of the recommendation. This is why we need to consider influences beyond turn design. The final category in the paper is the assertion. And in my opinion, this is the most interesting form of recommendation design in how it is delivered and how it is received. The most interesting thing about the assertion is that they are designed as informing actions. They deliver information only. These turns are noticeably absent of any explicit directives that would indicate any kind of verbal recommendation. In assertions, the doctor offers information about a treatment, its availability, and its effectiveness. In the sequential organization of these assertions, the patients consistently treat them as recommendations and respond accordingly. What's notable is that assertions, though relatively passive, offer very little by way of contingencies and imply rather high levels of entitlement for the doctor and assertions are present in everyday offers. You might offer the use of a spare bedroom to a friend by saying, I've got a spare room. This would be fitted to a longer sequence, but it's an act of providing information and allowing the recipient to decide what to do with it. This is an example of an assertion as a treatment recommendation. 
On line 8, the doctor asserts there is medication and we have it here. Information about the existence of a medication and its availability. On line 9, the patient initiates an overlap with a continuer. Note the final unit intonation is upward. On line 11, the doctor appears to initiate another turn, but on line 12, in overlap, the patient offers a more affirmative response. OK, that's good. This time with a downward final unit intonation. To summarise, the ways that treatment recommendations are designed can be seen to accomplish multiple actions. Pronouncements are explicit and direct expressions of medical authority. Suggestions position the doctor as the expert and pass the final decision to the patient. Proposals convey that the treatment and the decision to treat are a form of collaboration. Offers tend to convey that the doctor has relinquished some deontic authority. And finally, assertions rely heavily upon the doctor's epistemic authority and do so in a fairly implicit manner. And a final word on the setting. This is important when you consider the normative expectations of the clinical encounter. And with that, here are the questions that we're going to be addressing during our developmental session. Thanks for watching.